The Nova Scotia Wild Flora Society hosted an extended field trip to Cape Breton this past summer. And from July 25th to the 31st, we toured mainland Cape Breton, then added an additional trip to Scattery Island near Manadu on August 2nd and 3rd. Beth Sheila Kent was instrumental in making all this happen. And in particular, oops, why is it not turning? There we go. Uh, she contacted Bruce Hatcher, a marine biologist from CBU who transported us to and around the island in a zodiac. She also arranged accommodation for us in Louisburg. Unfortunately, she was unable to join us for the trip, so I dedicate this presentation to her in honor of all the efforts she made in her. Our Thank behalf. you very much, Terry. <laughs> Okay, so besides myself, and you can tell I'm not a guy who takes a lot of people pictures, um, besides myself, the other participants in the trip were Nova Scotia Wild Flora Society members Jeff White, there on the right, and Louise Cook and Marion Don Kennedy. So Scattery Island lies about two kilometers east of Manadu. Until 1949, it was the easternmost point in Canada but it was demoted to the easternmost part of Nova Scotia when Newfoundland joined Confederation. It has been used intermittently as a base for fishing by the French and English for over 300 years and eventually hosted a small community until the mid 1960s. At that time, the government of Nova Scotia resettled all the inhabitants to nearby Manada and declared the island a wilderness area. However, those few families of property on the island were grandfathered ownership of a few remaining houses and continued to visit the island for recreation. So on the first day, we traveled by Zodiac around the top of the island. And on the way, we saw a pod of about 16 pilot whales, although I'm sorry I wasn't able to get a closer picture with the camera hat at the time. And we traveled south towards the south end of Scattery, and we started to, to detect a strong odor. Kilometers later, we saw the carcass of a fin whale on the shore that Bruce told us had died from entanglement with fishing gear last May. Oh, wow. And that's amazing that it had lasted that long and was still so intact. And swimming nearby, were dozens of gray seals. Mm -hmm. So we landed on the beach near an abandoned house and walked through meadows of Virginian rose, Canada blue joint, and Canadian burnet. And we saw marsh skull cap everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the plants I'd hope to identify is called Swedish cornell which is a type of bunch berry. And a few hundred meters from our landing site, I saw a clump that looked very much like bunch berry, but it was had the distinctive, more upright growth and opposite leaves and venation of the Cornus suicitia. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> my Latin uh, works here. Um, it didn't have any fruit or the distinctive black centered blooms to better confirm the observation though Jeff did find another one with some berries later. But otherwise, everything else I saw on the island was the conventional bunch berry. Another rare plant I dreamed of finding was Arctic raspberry. This was documented on the island in 1971, but was not found during a four-day bio blitz of the island by Dell in 2005. Now, Rubus articus is not currently listed as existing in Nova Scotia's flora, but it is found in southern Newfoundland. It has a very distinctive large pink flower in June, but otherwise looks much like swamp dewberry, Rubus hispidus, but with heavier serrations in the leaf and without the pubescence on the underside. Now, at the edge of the trail, I did find a plant that seemed to match that description, but much as I would wish otherwise, I suspect it is just a variation of Rubus hospitus. And John, I don't know if you're there, but I'm curious if you've got any experience with this plant to make a comment on this. Uh, yeah, if it's the one I think it is, we've got a, oh, an awful lot of them. This is the one that has the pink flowers, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot. The, the, the last name, Arcticus, has changed back and forth a few times, but. Oh, yeah, okay. We just call it uh, Plum Boy. 
So I'm curious, like to identify, can you tell if this looks anything like it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think so. They don't trail really. No. I mean, this yeah. was sort of a clump. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I mean, really, I need to go back in June and see if there's a pink flower, really, is what it comes down yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but uh, if that's the case, it'll be the only one in Nova Scotia that's been documented in the last, I don't know, 40 years or so. Yeah, sometimes Carl Rube is a Carlos. Oh, okay. No stem. Okay. So anyway, uh, as I kept walking along, so the, the most easterly part of the island becomes a windswept barren, and there is an abandoned lighthouse at the tip. We saw many shorebirds, ruddy turnstones, sanderlings, semi-palmated sandpipers. The depressions are filled with soft stem bulrush and tufted bulrush. White spruce crumholtz gave way to Arctic silverweed and dwarfed starry false Solomon seal. Now the silverweed's interesting. I'm trying to re I went through a lot of trouble to try and sort out the silverweeds, and it sounds like the 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 Arctic one is the more common one in this area, at least in uh, Cape Breton area, uh, and it has to do with the underside of the leaves and uh, and. The, I forget. Anyway, I went through a lot of trouble to identify it. Now I can't like me remember what the keys were that I used. So <laughs> I think it's right. Um, the Starry False Solomon series, uh, Seal was unusual. It was growing really stunted uh, in such a windswept area, but it was all over the place. I, I was very surprised to see it. Also, another one that I was surprised to see was the rattlesnake root, the three, which again was very stunted. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of good old harebells. And, and so when I put this one into um, iNaturalist, I had somebody come back at me, correcting me that it wasn't the common harebell, it was Gisecki's harebell, because apparently in this part of the world, they've decided that the harebells that live here are this type, as opposed to the, I guess the other one's more European now. So another somebody did a nice a little split in the gene. So this is, if you see a harebell, this is likely what it is as far as iNaturalist is concerned anyway. Now traveling inland, or sorry, my mistake. So further down the path, and this is like really in the middle of the path, I thought I saw some dwarf self heels and decided to go down and have a look at it and realize this is quite different. And it's another rare plant that I had hoped to see in the island called spurred gentian. And while it can grow larger elsewhere, these plants are only two to three inches tall. Uh, they're considered endangered, and we only saw them in this area of the island. And that's, you can get an idea of the, uh, I mean, with gentians, there's sort of two types you tend to get. Some are the closed, like the bottle gentians, and the others are very open with these big blue flowers and that. So these are, this is actually a different genus. I think it's, uh, let's go back here. Is the, oops, sorry. Well. How do you go back here? There we are. Helenia, yeah. So it's it's not the gentian regular genus, it's its own thing, but it's clearly um, got that sort of bottle look to it. Quite an interesting flower, really. I'd love to see a pollinator going into it. Mm, there's a greenish form of it too. Oh, really? Okay. The flower is sort of a kind of a weird little pale green. It's uh, sometimes they give it a, its own variety, but same species yeah um then uh just so going so going inland we were started passing past several small bogs now one thing uh so there's some quite a number of instances of bog goldenrod now when i look at roland he talks about a variation of the bog goldenrod that has extended lateral uh branches on the blooms and he calls it variation terra novae so i took the opportunity to use that for this one here and there's several others that were similar to that um can't say i got a lot of feedback on iNaturalist about that but uh i'm going with that uh, also uh jeff of course spotted the curly grass fern as only he can <laughs> so there's a few instances of that in the bogs but another one that i was very interested in is this one called the northern burr reed Spragan. Sporanium, <laughs> I 
Uh, anyway, this is a smaller burr reed and its distinctive feature is a sort of roundness to the uh, spiky heads there. Uh, and it's listed as critically endangered in Nova Scotia. And it was growing in, you know, a number of little wet areas, uh, sometimes in a bit of water, sometimes just a, a very damp area. And it was generally fairly exposed. Now, we also saw some uh, standard bog things like cotton grass, white beak sedge, the inundated club, club sorry, inundated bog, bog club moss. That's helpful. As well as uh, club spur orchids and even a few rose pagonias that were still hanging on. So the center of the island is more forested and did come across a few interesting insects. Mm -hmm. um, the meadow hawk, I tried to identify that one and got a lot of pushback on iNaturalist that you can't identify without a meadow hawk without looking at the genitalia. So it's just that's just a meadow hawk. <laughs> uh, but the longhorn beetle, I believe that's one that uh, needs on uh, spruce trees, I think, if I'm correct. Now, this is something I came across, and I didn't even take much notice at the time. I just thought it was a regular soft uh, rush, uh, except it seemed a little congested, you know, like the, the, I felt like it just hadn't opened yet. It was, I thought maybe I had caught it at a certain time of the, its development. But in fact, this is, this is it. And it's called a compact rush, and it really never opens up as much as a soft rush would. It's just this little clump on the end of the stem. So going deeper into the woods, we saw the usual suspects, uh, some pine sap and ghost pipes. They were quite common throughout. And then we got into the orchids. And uh, so we had, there were two rattlesnake plantains we came across growing with each other, really. The lesser rattlesnake plantain, which is a very small plant. And then the checkered rattlesnake plantain, which is, can be a fair size. These were bits on the small side as well but they may grow as the season progresses a bit too. And then we saw a heartleaf toy blade. It's another one that Jeff spotted immediately. Um, and that's sort of an interesting one. And these are all over the place. There are a lot of these. And then came across this guy. Uh, unfortunately, my pictures aren't as good. It's a blunt leaved rain orchid. It took me a while to even identify it. Um, just had the single leaf there. So at this point, we came out of the woods towards the, uh, the end of the trail. This is the end of the first day. And in the pond, there is growing this common mare's tail, which I had heard of, but never actually seen. Uh, it appears vulgaris. So it's an odd, another one of these odd plants. I think it's in the plantain family of all things. Um, so uh, that's... So that pretty much covered the uh, the end of it. Now the following day, uh, Bruce took us into several coves around the island. But at that point, I was coming down with something. What I later discovered was a fairly heavy dose of COVID. So my pictures didn't do so well. So I didn't haven't bothered to <laughs> go into that. <laughs> uh, anyway, but uh, fortunately, it was just me. Nobody else got it. And uh, despite all that, I certainly found this a wonderful experience and I would gladly return and especially in June to see if I can find any of those pink Arctic raspberry flowers. There you go.